Um, it's my distinct uh, honor and pleasure to uh, introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Kayleen Asbo. Uh, Kayleen is a writer, cultural historian, mythologist, composer, poet, and retreat leader who offers classes, workshops, and pilgrimages, pilgrimages all over the world. Her work explores the intersection of history, spirituality, and the arts, and in topics, in topics ranging from Dante to Carl Jung and Hildegard of Bingen. Helene's particular passions are pilgrimage, the mystical tradition, and uncovering and recovering the role women have played in art and culture. She's educated in Smith College, Mills College, UC Santa Barbara, Meridian University, and the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. Dr. Osbo holds three master's degrees, one in music, one in psychology, and one in mythology. And she holds a doctorate in mythological studies with an emphasis in depth psychology from Pacifica Graduate Institute in Santa Barbara. She's created an online community, Rose Sangha, that follows the thread of the mystical tradition and the sacred feminine. And through her company, Mythica, she offers pilgrimages to sacred sites, and next year's pilgrimages will be journeying to Scotland, France, and England. And I encourage all of you to explore the links that we will be putting in the chat so that you can see uh, Kayleen's online presence, both her website, and sign up for her newsletter. It is beautifully done. It's not only informative, it's the most visually appealing newsletter that you're going to find. Mm -hmm. And so with, um, with no further ado, here is Dr. Kayleen Asbo. Oh, thank you, Denny. Thank you so much. Um, sometimes I think all of those words, you know, and all those titles can get into the way of, of what, what the heart of my quest is, which is to be a pilgrim. And tonight, my hope is to share with you some aspects of my own pilgrimage journey, because I hate to say this for people who are pursuing graduate education, but I'm going to be very heretical and say this, that really my experience of going to places like Chartres Cathedral, of walking the pilgrim paths of Lost St. Bohm or Assisi, that was a deeper kind of education than anything I ever read in books. And that word educare, originally came from this term that meant to lead the heart. And I'm going to invite us tonight to, to hold that question as we begin. What is it to be led by our hearts? To learn to tune to and listen to that still small voice that whispers in the depths of each and every one of our hearts. And in tonight's presentation, I'm going to be sharing a little bit about my journey of discovery that these two pillars of my spiritual life, the Gospel of Mary and the Chartres Cathedral Labyrinth, came and co-arose arose at the very same time. And both of them, I feel like, are holding up my whole life's journey in that quest to learn to listen with the ears of my heart. So I so hope that tonight will be a journey. I know some of you are labyrinth aficionados and others of you might say, what's a labyrinth? And similarly, some of you um, may have said, oh, like, like I first did. Oh, Mary Magdalene, wasn't she that person who's saying, I don't know how to love him and Jesus Christ superstar? Um, so I know and recognize and welcome that we're all coming from these different paths. And my hope is that these two pieces will offer you doorways for your own exploration, for the deepening of your own journey. Because I so believe that what they do is they help guide us. They are lights on the path. And after I share those stories, then we're going to actually experience a handheld labyrinth walk. This is a mini version. Um, there are several organizations, including this particular guild at Portland, um, and also on um, the online community of Veriditas, um, who has played an important part of my journey, who offer these handheld labyrinth walk experiences. And I'm sure they'll put some links in so that you can find out more about that as well. Um, and then of course, there's nothing like actually walking a labyrinth, whether it's at a cathedral or um, 
there's a whole labyrinth locator right now that you can find. You can Google any city that you're in and you can discover where is there a labyrinth open to the public. And then there are also ways that you can create your own labyrinth, whether that's of soup cans or seaweed, lots of possibilities. So the third part of my presentation as I talk about this before we do the handheld labyrinth walk is to talk about ways that you might bring these two things together, the gospel of Mary and the labyrinth. And I'm particularly interested in talking to two different communities and the ways that they might overlap. One is the so-called church community of Christians who are seeking to find new, innovative, and particularly embodied ways to bring liturgy to life again. And I'm also passionate about offering contemplative tools to people who have been, oh, church alienated or even church wounded um, to explore on your own. And remembering the, the, that those words from the gospel of wherever two or three are gathered together, there can be something extraordinary that happens. And I think both of these, the text of the gospel of Mary and labyrinth walks um, provide both of those things. So we do want to encourage in the chat box, if you have questions as I'm going through, I want to encourage you to put them in there. And then at the very last part of our program, um, we'll have our wonderful moderator scanning those and offering those questions or reflections, um, and I will respond to them. Before we begin, I, I also just want to make a mention, tonight is All Souls Night. All Saints Night and tomorrow is All Souls Day, excuse me. And this is a particularly hallowed time in different traditions, in the Celtic tradition, in the Mesoamerican tradition. Um, and what I'd love to invite as we begin today is to really feel ourselves in this stream of connection to the ancestors of the past and to imagine that right behind us as we begin and as we light our candle, we have our own ancestors, our parents and grandparents and great grandparents. And then surrounding them in a circle are all of the saints. And you can define a saint however you wish to. Um, I love the definition that a saint is someone who has kindled a light that shines throughout the generations. I'll say that again. A saint is someone who has kindled a light that shines throughout the generations, leading with a path of hope and healing. And so as we gather, I, when the different times were presented of when I could do this talk, I felt, ah, ah, I still want to do this for all souls because I want us to feel like we're drawing close to Mary Magdalene and we're drawing close to each other, those of us who are walking on this earth now, but we're also feeling close and holding close to our hearts, the memory of all those saints who've come before. So I am going to start our slideshow right now. And as we do so, I wanna invite you to light a candle with me. So get a candle and a match. And as we light our candles, I'm going to just invite this reflection, um, if you would, um, to think about the question, who is Mary Magdalene for you? And you could type into the chat box one word. I know that's hard, but one word for who Mary Magdalene is for you. And then if you would also just name one or two or three people who are other saints in your life that you hold close to your heart. I'm going to ask Patricia if she would play this song by my dear friend, Catherine Braslowski, whose hypnotic voice you heard as you entered into our room. So, um, Kayleen, I cannot play the music while you're sharing your slideshow. Oh, so I okay. need well, then I will sing this song for you. <laughs> and you can sing along with me if you wish. And, oh, Sancta. Magdalena, O Duchess, Amica, 
As I'm looking through your responses right now, I'm seeing things like sacred, courage, strength, every woman, beloved, love, mystery, first apostle, guide, goddess. And I'm delighted that I haven't seen a single response that says prostitute. And that is a huge difference from 20 years ago when I began work and leading workshops and retreats on Mary Magdalene. So many people would show up and about half of the people would say, isn't she a prostitute? Or wasn't she the adulteress? So I'm thrilled that the world has come so far in their journey to reclaim who Mary Magdalene was in the beginning of the Christian story. And we'll get to a little more of that in, the, in just a moment. But I want to say that Mary Magdalene came into my life the very same time that the labyrinth came into my life. And one of the ways that she is showing up these days, I have to say, I meet, I think I've met hundreds of people for whom this is true, is that she's shown up in their dreams, in their dreams. And that's how she showed up for me. She showed up in a dream, and at the time, I was in spiritual direction with the Reverend Dr. Lauren Artris, who many of you know was the founder of the Worldwide Labyrinth Movement, who was the person who revived the labyrinth in our time. And I was in spiritual direction with Lauren, and I brought this dream to her, and she asked me to draw the dream. And then a few months later, I was going to go on pilgrimage, my first pilgrimage, and my first time traveling where I wasn't a tourist, but a pilgrim. And in my suitcase, I carried the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, the, this particular edition that you see on the left. And that is uh, with a wonderful, wonderful commentary by Jean-Yves Leloup, um, who has a real depth psychology orientation. His commentary is, is marvelous. And it was translated into English by Joseph Rowe. And so I brought that in my suitcase and I came to the labyrinth and the day that I walked the labyrinth for the first time, this was the passage that I read. The blessed one, that's Jesus, greeted them all saying, peace be with you. May my peace arise and be fulfilled within you. Be vigilant and allow no one to mislead you by saying, here it is, or there it is. For it is within you that the Son of Man dwells. And then later, there's this passage of, this is why the good has come into your midst, to reunite you with your roots. And so I, I began that, that experience, and part of what drew me to Chartres Cathedral, what drew me to France, was that I had been at Grace Cathedral having this experience of washing feet for Monday Thursday in the Monday Thursday ritual. And while that foot washing, foot washing was going on, we were singing this song that I hope many of you know, a Teze song. Ubi caritas et Ubi caritas deus ibias. So that experience of foot washing had just made me cry with that song. And I cried and I cried and I didn't know why I was crying. And I went to Lauren and she said, well, I think before you come to Shark Cathedral, you should go to Teze. And so I did. 
And while I was waiting for the bus to carry me there, I met this beautiful black nun from Africa. And we talked about what was drawing us there. And I said, she said, why are you here? Why are you here? And I said, I'm not sure, except I cry when this song, whenever this song is here. And she said, ah, was it in Madeleine? which means you are a Magdalene. And she explained to me that those of us who are moved in our depths, moved off into tears by beauty, that that is a, a signature of the Magdalene path. So I tucked that away in my heart as I went to Sharp Cathedral with that book of the Gospel of Mary in my bag and Ubi Caritas ringing in my head. And I walked through this building and immediately, as some of you have, I'm sure, burst into tears again at the sheer astonishing beauty of the stained glass windows of the gorgeous statuary of this cathedral. And the experience that I was part of as a pilgrim with Veriditas under Lauren Artress's direction began in the crypt. And we had this gorgeous ritual where we passed by the Black Madonna to a well that had been sacred to the Druids. And we followed this pathway up into the cathedral that was just growing darker with, with uh, the sun setting. And we lit candles, these gorgeous stained glass windows. And we passed by what was at the time a black Madonna. This is how it looks now. And we came to the labyrinth. And what I heard as I went in this labyrinth walk, it was one of those experiences beyond time. It, it, what I heard was this voice that went straight to my heart and soul. And what I was hearing was the music that you heard when you entered in, Catherine Breslovsky singing on this album called Shark Path of the Soul. It was only years later that I met Catherine and her musical companion at a tiny little theater in Paris. And I began to talk to them. And I discovered that his name was Joseph Rowe. He was the English translator of the Gospel of Mary. And he was the man who was singing with Catherine. And so those two things that I experienced, both of them in the same place, is something that I started to pay attention to. Some of the music that Catherine was singing that I shared with um, pilgrims today, that we had this beautiful session of singing with Catherine who came to our Zoom session from France and we were singing some of the music of this confraternities, these Franciscan third orders who were dedicated to Mary Magdalene and St. Francis and they would sing music while they danced. And over the years, I found story after story after story that led me back to my heart. I was led by my tears, but when I followed those tears, I discovered things underneath the surface that have been the greatest adventure of my life. And it so reminds me of Lauren Artress's experience and what she has done with the world of giving this gift of the labyrinth that the labyrinth was covered over for 1500 years by chairs. And it was only when Lauren came there and started to literally lift the chairs off the labyrinth, that the beauty of this pattern was revealed, a pattern that invites each of us into the depth of our heart to listen for that still small voice that can guide us. And if you haven't had a chance, I so encourage you to sign up for one of these pilgrimages because they really are life-changing experiences. So, I've learned so many things, too many things to put in one evening and more than could fit even in my dissertation on Mary Magdalene, passion and paradox throughout culture. But some of the interesting little tidbits I'll give you, and I'll give them as like little seeds in case you want to follow them to learn more, is that there are several scholars, uh, Ian Begg and Jean Marcal, um, who have indicated that there are were originally 22 cathedrals in France that had labyrinths. And all of them had black Madonnas in them. And that's really interesting and significant because 22 has been a number associated with Mary Magdalene since the earliest days of Christianity. Her feast day, which we have written records all the way in England um, in the seventh century, I believe, saying it was always celebrated on July 22nd. 
And so that's very interesting. And there are a number of people, those two authors I mentioned, and, and the wonderful mythologist and, and psychologist, um, Anne Baring, who really believe that the Black Madonnas of Europe may actually refer to a, a more hidden and underground and esoteric teaching tradition of Mary Magdalene. So that's all I'm going to say about that right now, but it's one of those little seeds. So if you're feeling like a, ooh, a little tingle inside, I'm going to just invite you as we journey together today to notice what, what tingles inside of you. If there any moment where you get goosebumps or the hair on your neck stands up or you feel a tug on your throat, because I think paying attention to those is part of the Magdalene path. So at Chart Cathedral itself, um, and I, I do, I'm saying nothing to take away from the Virgin Mary, who I also honor and revere. And um, Chart Cathedral was constructed around the birthing veil of, um, of Mary. And there are all kinds of statues and stained glass windows that refer to her as well. But there are also some things that are puzzling and disturbing. And one of them is this statue. This is an older statue. It's not from the Middle Ages, but this statue, which is of Mary Magdalene on the left and Jesus on the right. And it's the famous scene of, from the Gospel of John where Mary's reaching out to Jesus and Jesus is blessing her and saying, do not cling because I have not yet ascended. Um, and this is how it looks if you go to Chartres Cathedral now. There's this big gap between the two of them but this is how closer to how it was intended. They were actually meant to be almost touching. I couldn't quite get my Photoshop to do it exactly right, but they were originally on one pedestal together. They were originally united. And after several centuries, for whatever reason, we don't know, somebody destroyed that original unity and they separated it. And I feel like that's, a big part of what has happened with the Christian story is that the original place of Mary Magdalene was erased, it was replaced, and it was defaced. And we are only now, and this is something I'm so grateful for, it is only now in our lifetime. It is only now in our lifetime. It is only the past few decades that we're beginning to restore the image to what was originally intended that includes some of those words that you put in the chat box, the apostle to the apostles, the great wisdom teacher or the embodiment of Sophia is one of her titles that has been reclaimed from the Nag Hammadi texts of Egypt. <laughs> Excuse me, scriptures that were hidden in the sands, in the caves for 1500 years and were only found in 1945 and then only translated in the past few decades, all of which point to Mary Magdalene as this courageous figure of, of amazing compassion, witness, solidarity, and also deep insight and teaching in her own right. And so if you're unfamiliar with this, um, I can't urge you enough to explore the gospel of Mary Magdalene. And I would really encourage you, if you haven't done so already at Trinity, I think it would be fabulous for you to have a book study group. Because even though the text itself is only seven pages, it's only seven pages because several pages are missing. Those seven pages are enough to rock your world. As Hal Tausig, Tausig and his uh, his uh, committee of 22 uh, priests, biblical scholars have said that this gospel, um, they consider to be the most single most important text that has been recovered in our own time. And he says it's essential reading, essential reading for today's Christian. I've led study groups on this now for 15 years. And you can take one line or one page and you can spend hours with that one line or one page. It is so, so deep. So I'm just going to give you a few highlights right now. And it's my hope that you'll see that what it's inviting you into is, is really to claim the goodness inside of your own heart. And its its central message, if I were to summarize it, is this message that we all have goodness inside of us, but that we go astray and we fall out of balance. And the message inside this book is 
what do we need to do to find the inner harmony, to reclaim our balance, to return to our best selves, to awaken the eyes and ears of our heart? What can we do to do that? So I love, I love this, this quote that I said before. I'm just going to invite you to read it aloud with me so you can hear it in your own voice with your own mouth. This is why the good has come into your midst. It acts with elements of your nature to reunite you with your roots. So think about that for a minute. That, that offers a version of Christianity and a spiritual pathway where our foundational essence is is not depravity as saint augustine thought it's not an original sin that is is irredeemable but rather it's the essence of goodness that we've forgotten that we've fallen into a sleep of forgetfulness and so some of the teaching in this is to say that the way that we find harmony the way that we return to balance is to take inspiration from manifestations of our true nature. So what is that? How do we find our way back to what our true nature of goodness is? And this emphasis on, on looking inside our hearts to believe that God dwells inside the depths of our hearts and that we're so distracted and busy these days that, that it's hard to hear that voice in the tumult of the world. And those of you who are habitual labyrinth walkers will recognize then that that's one of the things that the labyrinth offers us. It offers us a spiritual practice to bring us back to our own true nature in a way that we can quiet the world around us and listen for that voice inside. So I feel like those texts, that text and that practice are such such mirrors of one another. I love this icon um, by our Mythica colleague, Mary Jane Miller, who lives in Mexico. She's a sacred iconographer. iconographer. And this is her image of um, Yeshua, Jesus, and Mary Magdalene here. And Jesus holds the book with the Alpha and Omega, and Mary holds this scroll. Uh, it's almost a scroll that's been written in invisible ink. And I, I like to think of that as being the pages that we haven't yet recovered of the Gospel of Mary, of her teachings. And here they are side by side um, in this way that is very, for me, redolent of that wonderful phrase, Anamkara, of soul friends or soul companions um, that have a shared purpose. And throughout the Gospel of Mary, um, there's this emphasis on what is it to awaken to become fully human. And Jesus leads Mary Magdalene in this visionary experience that happens in this word, this Greek word, the nous, N-O-U-S, that was on the other page. And um, she says, um, how is it that I'm seeing you? Am I seeing you from the spirit or the soul? And he says, you are experiencing me in the nous, in the in-between. Um, I think followers of Henri Corbin would say, this is the imaginal place. This is the place of dreams and visions. Carl Jung would, would point us to this as the essence of depth psychology, you know, where those images and those archetypes arise. And this journey that he leads her on takes her with a soul's ascent through these realms that we can recognize are, they're called climates. And they're, they're places that human beings encounter in our own psyches. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever been angry. Oh, not very many people are raising their hand. I guess there's just a few of us. Um, there we go. Um, or have you ever felt, you know, fear or um, despair? Um, so he takes her through these climates where she has to confront the darkness within herself. And as she meets, those, um, those forces within with courage and with strength and with clarity, she moves beyond them. And then she finally finds herself in the place of silence and repose. And she comes back and tells the other disciples that this was her vision and that the teacher spoke to her in silence. So this is the journey that if we put together with 
the Nag Hammadi texts of Gospel of Philip and Gospel of Thomas and some of the other recovered texts where Mary Magdalene is revered as a fountain of wisdom, they point us to this word, anthropos, which is at the root of anthropology. What is it to claim our full humanity? What is it to live into the best human that we can be? And I so believe that Mary Magdalene is a phenomenal guide in this process, that her teaching and her wisdom, both in the Gospel of Mary and some of the other texts that I just referred to, but also what I call the Magdalenian tradition that flourished in Southern France, where she was said to arrived around the year 42 as an evangelist and teacher in Southern France, what was known at that time as Gaul. But that tradition has so much to offer us about ways that we can tune ourselves to the depths of our hearts and find great wisdom within there. So some of these things that I think can really speak to us regardless of what path we are on I, in my workshops, in my teachings, I, I have had everyone come. I have had Dominican nuns. Um, I've, I've done workshops for Dominican nuns, Episcopalian clergy. I have done workshops um, for people who have brought together interfaith communities of Jewish scholars and pagan priestesses and a large group of people who would consider themselves to be nuns this, the, in the N-O-N-E-S category of I don't feel like I belong to any particular faith or any particular tradition, but they're questing in their own heart to come to, um, to know the sacred in a deeper way. And I think one of the reasons that Mary Magdalene is particularly potent for our time is that <laughs> in France, the, the stories of her preaching and teaching are that she was not confined within church walls that she actually brought this message of hope and healing into communities, into ordinary life. So the center um, image that you see from the 15th century is of Mary Magdalene and her pulpit is not inside of a cathedral, it's in a forest made of trees. And around her are men and women, old and young, you know, mothers with babies and hermits listening from far off. And one of the messages that the Gospel of Mary calls us to is this returning to our roots. And we have these beautiful examples in the Magdalenian tradition then that, that we've forgotten who we are. And it's by getting closer to nature, by getting closer to our nature of what we came into the world with as children, where we will find a sense of reunion. So um, on the right, um, for those of you who don't know, this is the legendary place where Mary Magdalene spent the last 30 years of her life. After preaching and teaching in Southern France in Aix-en-Provence and Marseille, she retired to a contemplative life here. And if you take your finger and just trace the image on the right and follow that path right in the middle of the screen above the tree line, you will see a building, which is a monastery now tended by Dominicans that is clustered around the cave, the grotto of La Sainte Baume, where Mary Magdalene was said to have prayed and received visionary experiences and was lifted up, I love this phrase, lifted up by the songs of the angels seven times a day to be fed with the music and bread of heaven. Um, I talk, go into this in much greater detail in my series, 22 Days with Mary Magdalene, and some of that story will be unfolding in the next few days as well. Um, I have a new 22 ser day series of Mary Magdalene in Provence, and it's, it's not too late. If you would like to join, you can still join um, tonight or tomorrow to be part of that and to learn more about that story. But in short, what I'll say is that I've discovered over the past 20 years of pilgrimage and research and reading more books than you would ever want to read, um, that I really believe that Mary Magdalene is the mother tree of the contemplative tradition. That when you trace back the mystics, whether it's Catherine of Siena or Teresa of Avila or St. Francis, most particularly, you find that all of those roads 
lead back to Mary Magdalene and this teaching of how do we achieve a sense of divine union? What are the practices that we can adopt that can help tune our souls so that we can hear that still small voice with ever greater clarity and assurance? Another reason then that I think she's so important is I think in our own time, we are desperately in need of returning to nature, of finding harmony with nature, with the ecological crises that we find ourselves in. Her message is so congruent to paying attention to the wisdom of nature and also stands as an invitation, an invitation um, that maybe maybe we may not be finding the spiritual nourishment that we need where we once thought to search for it. Maybe we need to go into the forest ourselves. Maybe we need to go not just into the cave of our heart, but, but actually literally go on pilgrimage as centuries upon centuries of mystics did. You know, when Catherine of Siena was seeking the courage to confront the Pope and say, you must return from Avignon, you must go back to your people in Rome, she stopped here first. And she went to that cave and she prayed for, um, for courage and strength and for Mary Magdalene's wisdom to be with her, to embolden her and to inspire her. St. Patrick believe it or not, this is an amazing piece, you know, went on pilgrimage himself. He came to France to learn how to be a monk and he would have walked this pathway on the festival of Mary Magdalene and gone to that cave and listened for the wisdom inside his own heart. So what might we do? Not all of us can go to France, but maybe we can find a place, even if it's just a local park or a forest where we can sit and calm ourselves Listen to what the babbling waters have to say. Listen for the trees and see what whispers inside of us. There are movements throughout the world right now of something called wild church that are trying to reclaim this idea of creating sacred space in nature. And it's not a new idea. This is what St. Francis and the followers of Mary Magdalene in the third order that confraternity did. They sang and they danced and they went to the forests and they prayed there and found great encouragement, particularly during the times of Black Plague. So for this next part of what I wanna share, I wanna offer some practices. Again, for those of you who are part of church communities, oh, it would thrill me beyond belief if you would potentially take at the idea of some of these things and, and come to your community and say, hey, how about we do one of these things for Holy Week? Um, because I found in the past few years of bringing them to communities has been so rich. And it's been rich in a way that's been unexpected in its outreach that, that yes, some of the regularly churched folks will come, but you'll often find people um, who are hungry for spiritual nourishment, but are very wary of traditional dogma or traditional um, practices that have, have wounded or alienated them. And then for those of you who are you know, free-floating spiritual seekers, um, this is such rich territory. You don't have to have a big building. Again, you can gather as early Christians did in your own living room or outside in nature. And to imagine what would it be like when Holy Week comes this next year, what would it be like to try on some of these practices? And this is a, a place where the labyrinth can play a particularly important role. So the early design, the early pattern of Holy Week was a many, many, many day celebration. And it, it charts this archetypal journey that I think can speak to each and every one of us because this pattern that I'm gonna describe also touches on our journey in life. You know, Palm Sunday be, marks the beginning of Holy Week and it's this expectation of triumph of hooray, hooray, you know, Jesus has a triumphant entry into Jerusalem. It's like, I've, you know, his disciples are, yay, here comes the new world, we've made it. And very quickly, the story begins to turn. The story begins to turn. And 
in the traditional um, celebrations of this in most churches, then we fast forward from Palm Sunday, and then we go to Maundy Thursday for those churches who observe this with a foot washing. But ultimately, that story ends with betrayal, with Jesus being betrayed by Judas, by being uh, denied by St. Peter, um, and we leave him bereft and alone in the garden. And then the churches pick up this thread of the walk to the cross on Good Friday with this liturgy that commemorates the three hours on the cross. And then we go to Easter Sunday. But in the original pattern, there were other days in between this that I think we've lost and have particular importance for reclaiming because they give us a richer story. And they give us a richer story, particularly if we walk in the footsteps of Mary Magdalene in this journey. Churches have emphasized walking in the footsteps of Peter in the journey. And while that deserves attention, um, it's a very different thing. And as I describe this, I just want to invite you to imagine for yourself, what would it feel like if this was the story that you entered into for Holy Week? So after the events of Palm Sunday, you come and you begin a, a liturgy, a ritual on Wednesday. And this is the ritual of anointing. It commemorates the journey of anointing in the house of Bethany. Oops, sorry. And so we begin with this with Jesus. The word Christ means anointed one. And who anoints Jesus? Well, in the French tradition, Mary of Bethany becomes Mary Magdalene with the act of anointing, just as Jesus becomes Jesus Christ when she anoints him. So imagine that you come and it's Wednesday and you come to a candlelit labyrinth at your cathedral and there are not priests, but lay people. And they offer you a blessing of anointing on your forehead, touching you on the forehead, touching you on the heart, inviting you to put a drop of oil in your own palm and drink it beautiful, drink in the smell of spikenard and rose and frankincense and myrrh and drink that in with the words, remember, remember, remember who you are. Remember that you were created in love and for love. You are beloved. And then imagine that you walk on the labyrinth, remembering all that is good and beautiful inside you and all the goodness and beauty that you have known in your life. That the good, as in the Gospel of Mary says, the good has come into your midst to reunite you with your roots. And then imagine that we go to Monday Thursdays. And while that has often emphasized betrayal, abandonment, denial, and violence, imagine that this time there is this different story as well. Some of the early Christian texts that we have recovered from Nag Hammadi talk about something called the round dance of Jesus. And I would just encourage any of you who are curious to look this up. You can find this round dance of Jesus on the web if you search it. And it has a very different kind of call and response that invites us into our full humanity. And this is was done as a dance. So imagine what it is to imagine our journey as human beings, like the Chart Labyrinth dance was done, taking three steps forward and one step back, three steps forward, and one step back, but holding hands in this journey of life. So to invite our senses in, and again, you don't have to go to a church to do this. You can do this in your own home. During COVID lockdown, I just did it with one person, my beloved, but we washed each other's feet and we talked about this mandate to love. And then we sat in silence and contemplation a wonderful song for this from Teze is um, stay with me, remain with me, watch and pray. And to just sing this as a mantra, sing this as a chant, as, as an invitation to going into the depths. 
Now, ironically, on Sunday morning, most churches have a reading that doesn't even talk really sufficiently about the resurrection. It talks about this race to the tomb, about Peter and John running to the sepulcher on the morning. And we don't even get to the story of the first witness. And all of that strikes me as terribly strange and actually rather tragic. It actually is a colossal act of institutional forgetting and amnesia. Because if we go to the actual biblical text, don't take my word for it, you can search for yourself, go to blueletterbible.org and put in Mary Magdalene, and it will do a search on all of the ways that she appears. And what you'll discover is that all of the gospel stories name her as a witness to the crucifixion. Strangely, only one of them mentions Jesus's mother, but all of them mention Mary Magdalene. There she is in, in the scarlet red uh, cloak that you see, uh, Mother Mary in the blue, but behind her, Mary Magdalene. And I always find it so interesting in so much of art history that very often Mary Magdalene and Jesus are dressed identically as they are here. They're both wearing scarlet red robes. You can connect their gaze there. And so we have in the Bible, Mary Magdalene as the faithful witness. We have her there at the foot of the cross that she's there until he takes his last breath, faithful witness. I imagine her chanting that psalm that he chants from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Singing it and chanting it with him. We have the stories in the Bible of her being present at the deposition. Here she is in Botticelli's beautiful image, cradling the body of the crucified Christ in her arms with such tenderness. And this, this sense that throughout centuries, you know, so much of her presence has been testified to by the artists like Giotto, but in our actual liturgies, we completely neglect her. We neglect her as well for the resurrection because all of the gospels, although they differ on virtually everything else, what time of day, who was there, what happened, was it an angel, was it a man in white, all of those details change. But in every one, Mary Magdalene is the witness. Some of that, the tellings of the gospel writers, she's accompanied by other women as the image that you see on the left. In the gospel of John, she is the singular witness whom Christ charges to return to the apostles and to bear with her the good news of the resurrection. So what would it be to reclaim Mary Magdalene as the central figure to the Christian story? She is there for the crucifixion. She is there for the deposition. She is there putting the body in the tomb and she is there at the resurrection. How can it be that we've written her out of the Christian liturgy? And what would it mean, not just for the experience aesthetically of Easter, but what would it mean for all of our hearts that rather than walking solely in the footsteps here of Judas, who denies, who betrays Jesus, and Peter, who denies Jesus, and the other apostles who leave and abandon and flee and betray him, what would it mean if we followed in her footsteps every step of the way with courage, with compassion, with faith, with tenderness, and with devotion? So I love this image um, that's at the monastery of Saint-Michel du Var. This is the monastery where Jean-Yves Leloup now lives half of the year um, as a French Orthodox priest under the name Father Seraphim. And um, this is where these beautiful frescoes are. So the place, the, the mind that conceived uh, of the, all of that gorgeous commentary of the Gospel of Mary um, is also the mind behind the inspiration for some of these frescoes that were beautifully realized by Vadim Garin. So here we have the anointing. And you see that image on the left. And then in, in the center is this image of the risen Christ in glory. But I love that that risen Christ in glory is flanked by these two pillars, Mary's anointing of Jesus on the left, and then Christ's washing of the disciples' feet. This mandate to love, this offering of love, being the twin pillars and honoring her place 
in that story. And what would it be then after Holy Wednesday and Maundy Thursday on Good Friday to see how we could walk with Mary Magdalene? I've been in count, I can't recount how many times I've been in Good Friday processions. And they're usually very good about remembering um, Mother Mary in different ways. There's a, a whole host of gorgeous liturgical music. Um, that has been written for, um, for Good Friday from Mary's perspective, the Stabat Maters, for example. And, and we do offer in some acknowledgement that there was grief. But for me, for me, that Good Friday experience has often been a strangely disembodied experience. Um, and this is where, again, the labyrinth can be so helpful because at Chartres Cathedral, the labyrinth was actually used. It was symbolically intended that as many steps as you would take on that labyrinth pathway to the center was symbolically held to be as many steps as Jesus took to the cross. And so you could imagine yourself as Mary Magdalene following in Jesus's footsteps. And when you got to the center, bearing witness to that, to the suffering and the grief and the sorrow. So what would that be like? What would it be like to expand our idea of Good Friday and to have a labyrinth walk? And before people take that labyrinth walk to enter into writing their own litany of lamentations. It could be as simple as a list of I grieve for or I, I hold the tears for and you could name every way that the world is suffering from the girls in Iran to the environmental collapse that we're facing to your own personal sorrows and grief. But to write all of what you're grieving down and then to offer that in the center, to leave that as an offering, mingling your tears with Mary Magdalene's tears, with Jesus's tears. It's a very profound possibility. So I just put this up, perhaps you might want to even take a, a, a snapshot shot of this, but some of the music that's particularly wonderful for accompanying this sort of grief ritual are these lessons of lamentation and sorrow that were written across the centuries, specifically for Good Friday, um, things that are called Tenebre or uh, Gregorio, uh, Gregorio Allegri's Miserere, which was sung in the Sistine Chapel or Box, St. Matthew and St. John's Passion. All of this is music that can help us enter more deeply into our own sorrows. But to bring back that, that idea of, of the um, connection to nature, I have also experienced some of the most powerful Good Friday liturgies um, of all, not in a church, but again, in nature. And so you could do the labyrinth ritual on like you see the labyrinth at chart on the left, but you could also search out the, the labyrinth locators to find one outside. This particular one is in California. It's in the Marin Headlands. Um, and there are, are, are many, there are hundreds throughout the world that you can Google and search and find. And what would that be like to go out into nature and to feel as Christ was out in the open to feel yourself walking on Good Friday on a labyrinth path, each step thinking about the sorrows of the world. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity to go with friends or community and make a labyrinth. Um, this is one that I made out of stones. It's not the sharp pattern because that is far more complicated, but uh, you can Google online. I think Lars Hallett has a wonderful site where you can learn how to draw labyrinths um, that follow the sharp pattern, but you can also make a simple classical version like this is. Um, and I've also made them with seaweed. Seaweed is so easy. You can make a labyrinth in 10 minutes with seaweed following the classical pattern. Um, and one of the really meaningful um, Good Friday liturgies that I've experienced um, was a few years ago, um, 2019. Um, this is another resource that I'd, I'd encourage anybody interested in bringing together the realms of eco-spirituality with Christian liturgy. Um, you may even want 
uh, Vincent Pizzuto to be a, a speaker for you sometime at Trinity Cathedral. He's a great contemplative. In fact, his book is called Contemplating Christ. Um, but he's a master at creating eco liturgies. And this one that he did in 2019, I took a, a picture of what it involved. The, the church community came together and we went to the local beach and we brought bags um, and he made this important connection that, you know, the crucifixion happened to Rabbi Jesus all those centuries ago, but we are crucifying our earth every day. And if we really believe that the Christ spirit is in creation as Christianity teaches, then we need to be really mindful of this and ask the question, how can we honor this and what can we do? So the community left and we went to the beach and we spent several hours gathering garbage that was on the beach. Unfortunately, this is probably true in every beach. Um, it doesn't have to be a beach. It could be a park, it could be the city streets, your local neighborhood, but the ways that we, that we desecrate our mother earth. So there are, are, are the congregants on the left going to the beach in the mist and the fog. And after two hours then, um, we had lunch and we talked about the importance of mourning and grieving. We came back to the church and then around the high Celtic cross that you see on the right, he had us place all of this garbage and really contemplate what we're doing to the earth. We had a stations of the cross where each station also referred to the desolation and desecration of the earth and its creatures. It was um, profound. And after dinner, then we all had a, a listening session and give, giving voice to our sorrows before we did a Taze service at night in the darkness that really helped those who hadn't been able to cry before. It really cracked open their hearts to be able to have an experience of shared lamentation, something that, that I think we're slightly afraid of in the Western world. You know, in the ancient Greek world, there were actually people who were hired to be the lead mourners. It was recognized that we needed catharsis. Catharsis is at the root of spiritual cleansing. And that in order to do that, we needed to make space for there to be tears. So I would encourage you all to consider, you know, how could you really come into an embodied experience of grief? You know, one of the symbols of Mary Magdalene is tears. The word maudlin means filled with tears. And so if we walk in her path, we're allowing ourselves permission to give expression to the grief that we're all carrying. And there are so many psychologists who would tell you that this is an essential part of healing to be able to express your grief and have it witnessed or have it shared. So I think one of the most profound things that, that churches could do or communities could do is to read the book, The Wild Edge of Sorrow by Francis Weller and to imagine for themselves, how could we do this? How could we have grief rituals that really don't just give lip service to Jesus on the cross, but really we feel it in a much deeper way together. And another community who's done this that you might wanna look up is the Iona community in Scotland. And um, just like the ritual that I described in Inverness, California, here at the Iona community in Scotland, they are also in a process of revisioning their Good Friday liturgies to bear witness to the suffering of the planet and the earth um, and, and the peoples of this earth and the creatures of this earth. So that's another resource you might wanna explore for inspiration. And then we get to Holy Saturday. And this is, I think, the most neglected of the, the three high holy days that's known as the Tridium. Um, many churches do nothing. And yet I think there's a profound opportunity to travel deeper with Jesus and deeper with Mary Magdalene. The themes of Holy Saturday are descent, silence, darkness, that phrase to be still and wait without hope for hope would be hope of the wrong thing. These are the words of T.S. Eliot in East Coker. 
and contemplation. Those are all important parts of those theme, but, but most churches leave people on their own if they mention that at all. But this becomes really this double-edged invitation for me. And I, I did this for the first time last year for a Holy Week retreat at Bishop's Ranch an Episcopal Center in Healdsburg, California, where we had two parts. One is, you know, the earliest references to what happened on Saturday um, that I know of are in the Athanasian Creed, which predates the Nicene Creed, in which it talks about how Jesus descended to the dead. And this image by Fra Angelico captures this, where he's bursting down the door, and he is stretching out his hand, and he is liberating and bringing out from the darkness the ancestors. So Adam and Moses, you see John the Baptist with his wild brown hair and the rope around his waist, that, that the, the ancestors, the spiritual ancestors of humanity, this um, theological idea that Jesus was liberating them. So I want to ask you this question. Uh, we're living in a time where more and more attention has been given to intergenerational patterns of trauma and the importance of healing those, um, healing our own lineages. You know, many of us who worked in therapy have worked with our family systems and the traumas that our parents and grandparents unwittingly passed to us. But then there's also the trauma that we're having to account for, for systems of trauma, of colonialism and racism and, and the horrors that have been perpetrated to women over the centuries. So there's that collective reckoning, whether that's at the country level or the governmental level or any institutional level, including the church itself. So there's a lot of healing that needs to happen. And the Eastern Orthodox tradition has these beautiful images. I, I just love this. It's called the Anastasis icon. It's also known as the harrowing of hell. And in it, you see Jesus in the middle there. He is the bridge. And on one side, he's reaching out to Adam and Moses and King David. And on the other side is this woman in red who they're holding hands. And, you know, people will debate and say, oh, is it Mother Mary or is it Mary Magdalene? I don't know if that matters so much. What it what it is the point here, though, is that this bridge, the importance that before the resurrection happens, before new life is truly possible, that there's something that we're called to do to go back and to heal the ancestors. Here's another one of those images again that you can see. We too, we too are called to go back and heal the ancestors. So one thing that we did on this day-long retreat, it was part of the three-day-long retreat, but we contemplated this icon and asked ourselves the question, you know, where am I called to do healing in the world? Where am I called to liberate the ghosts of the past? And we wrote letters to our ancestors, particularly ones who needed the sorrows of their life witnessed. You know, all of us have stories of grandmothers or grandfathers, you know, um, ancestors who escaped the Holocaust or who were sold into slavery or who endured horrific abuse. Um, and what, what would it be like if we were to write a love letter to them saying, I witness your pain, or I forgive you, or I wish for you healing and hope. So we wrote those letters, and then we had a ritual where we stood around the labyrinth with a bowl of water filled with salt water for tears and floating with rose petals. And we spoke those words of the names of the people who have passed who needed healing, who died that we needed to forgive or who died in a state of grief and darkness. And I can only say that many of the people there reported it being a life-changing experience. So what would that be like to walk on a labyrinth? And you could invite people to bring photos of their ancestors with them and or to bring a photo of something that they felt was a wound that needed healing in our world and to hold that and walk with that on the labyrinth and then to offer that to the center and then to sing that to the center, sing Ubi Caritas. The other thing that I think makes a beautiful pairing and that we did last year 
is that the gospel of Mary, many scholars think that the vision that she describes, where she describes the soul's ascent through the climates, where she's confronting the powers of wrath and darkness, and ultimately achieving this state of liberation guided by Jesus, where she then rests in silence and fulfillment. Many people say that they think that that vision happened on Saturday, so that we go through in the narrative, you know, we have uh, Mary Magdalene anointing Jesus and the house of Bethany, companioning him on Good Friday to the cross, being there as his body's taken down. And then she goes into the darkness on Holy Saturday. You know, Jewish tradition said not to tend to the body until after the Sabbath had passed. So what was Mary doing on the Saturday? And many people feel like this is when she had her great vision, because when the narrative of the gospel of Mary begins, um, she, the, all of the disciples are having this experience of the resurrected one, the blessed one who comes to give them another teaching, and then he disappears. And it's said that the disciples are in fear and doubt and trembling, and they turn to Mary and they say, Sister, tell us what you know that we do not know, what you have experienced that we have not. And then Mary stands up and she gives them a message to not be in fear and doubt and that she will share with them what she experienced and she recounts the vision. So I love this idea of parallels that as Jesus is descending into the realm of the dead to heal the ancestors, Mary is ascending in her own healing journey guided by Jesus. And I love that, that the masculine goes down and the feminine goes up because that's actually an inversion of the, um, the alchemical understanding that very often um, the, the triangle that points downward to the earth is considered the, ma um, the feminine triangle. And the one that points up to heaven is considered the masculine triangle. And some of the teachers at Chartres Cathedral said that this for them was the meaning of the, the seal of Solomon, or we call it the star of David, of the interlocking two triangles is the union of the masculine and the feminine, a union of above and below. And so I love that idea that the masculine is, is going, taking the feminine journey down into the earth and the feminine is taking the masculine journey up into the realms and both of them are claiming their fullness and this sense of union. So that vision um, of Mary um, is a beautiful text to read in community. Um, again, being only seven pages, it doesn't take that long. It takes, you know, maybe 20, uh, 20 I, I forget what it was when we timed it, but like 20 minutes to read the whole thing, no more than 30. But if you're familiar with the process of Lexio Divina, of working with the text, of journaling with the text, of, 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 or just simply having a discussion, it yields so much richness. So I feel like those are, are two very complementary things that you can do. You can do them out in nature, you can do them in a living room, or you could do them in a cathedral that bring those two deeply embodied practices together. Um, in my own work, I created um, for Holy Saturday um, a passion play. In the Middle Ages, um, in the, in the very monastery where the bones of St. Benedict lie at Saint Benoit sur Loire in France, um, at the, um, I think it was the year 1100, um, there was a medieval passion play that was created. And it was in the dark and a, a lantern was brought and it was Mary Magdalene coming with the lantern in the darkness. And the voices of the angels called out to her, quem queritas, who is it that you are seeking? And um, dramatic music like this, dramatic musical drama had been actually forbidden um, for 1600 years because it had been associated with the Greek god Dionysus. And this was the very first time of something that we might look at and say, oh, that sort of seems like opera came back into the world. And it started this whole tradition of what are called medieval mystery plays. And so it began with Mary Magdalene coming to the tomb. And there's a whole host of these in the Middle Ages that are hard to find, but they inspired me with the question, well, what would that look like in our own time? What if we told the story of Easter through Mary Magdalene's eyes? 
So I wrote this passion play, which is very much a participatory musical drama. There are slides of art throughout the centuries there. There's several different versions of it, and I'm going to make available the easiest version um, for, for individuals and, and communities and churches to have access to if they want to, if they want to create it and stage it themselves this year, because it just involves a narrator who's reading a combination of the Gospel of John, the Gospel of Mark. Um, as well as the Gospel of Thomas um, as part of this drama. And then there are places for the audience to respond to the text by singing either music I've written myself or to use Taze chants as a responsory and times for you to light your own candle and extinguish the cancel and, and, and extinguish the candle and then to anoint each other. Um, and so I've done this twice before COVID um, in church communities um, on Saturday evening. And I am going to film it and make it available so that the, those of you who might want to stream it um, on Holy Saturday to watch for yourself. Um, another thing I would really recommend though is to watch the absolutely brilliant, oh, it is so brilliant, Peter Sellers staging of Simon Rattle's production uh, with the Berlin Philharmonic of St. Matthew's Passion, which has been staged and you see Mary Magdalene and the Virgin Mary side by side um, in the most exquisite, heart-rending, gorgeous drama. It's three and a half hours long, but it's absolutely exquisite. So um, I would really encourage you um, to take on that for this night that in many, many churches doesn't have much going on. Um, and then for East, there, there's an image for, from the slideshow of when we did this there of uh, the Passion of Mary Magdalene. Um, so, and then the Easter, the, then we would go into um, Easter and the Easter rituals that I would just in, encourage you to consider doing um, would be to go into nature again. What would it be like to walk in her footsteps and hurry before dawn and to greet the sunrise and to feel that sense that new life is possible. There are hopeful possibilities before us, even as the world seems like it may be falling apart. That one of the things that Mary Magdalene teaches us that I think is such an important message. You know, when she went to the tomb, she mistook Jesus for the gardener. And some people say, well, that's because she was crying or others say, well, she was a Jewish woman. So she was averting her eyes for a masculine figure. Um, but I love it. This idea that is often portrayed by artists across the centuries where Jesus actually has a gardener's hat and a hoe that what does that mean to be a gardener? Well, it's a return to Eden. It's a return as Jesus was called to being the new Adam. And in the middle ages, Mary Magdalene was called the new Eve, that where the first Eve had been disobedient and faithless, Mary Magdalene was faithful at every step of the way. And that she brought forth in her faithfulness, in her devotion, in her love, that she helped open the gates for a new Eden. So what a glorious thing it would be to plant plant a garden yourself or to be in a garden to um, to welcome the dawn and to feel that surge of new life and to say to yourself well Jesus didn't new life didn't look the way Mary Magdalene was expecting I'm sure that you know she wasn't expecting that she was going to end up on a rudderless boat across the seas in France in a land far away you know life didn't appear the way she thought it would but it was rich and fulfilling nonetheless and it was filled indeed with hope and consolation and promise of so many things. And I was so delighted when for the first time a couple of years ago, I heard a priest say in his church sermon on Easter Sunday, and Mary Magdalene was there to greet him, the first Christian. <laughs> and I would just so dearly love for all of you to become apostles and to become evangelist, to reclaim her rightful place, her rightful place in Christian liturgies at the forefront, that we walk in her footsteps to feel, 
to, to draw on her courage and her compassion, her ability to speak her truth from her own inner knowing, even in the face of disbelief, even in the face of criticism, the gospel of Mary says, are we supposed to believe these things? Andrew and Peter say, do you really talk to a woman like this and not us? And one of the other disciples has to come to her defense. And Matthew, also known as Levi, says, ah, oh, are you attacking her too, Peter, just like the enemies do? Don't you know that Jesus knew her and loved her and he trusted her? And I think that that we need to bring her to the light in her honored place that has been cut out, erased, replaced. And I think the labyrinth is a beautiful way to do this. It's an embodied practice that invites us into the depth of our hearts to listen to what our inner knowing is, to behold that still small voice that speaks to us as the beloved, and then to find the courage to go forth and share that with the world. And frankly, I think that has a lot of potential for doing healing and making whole the things that have been torn asunder and lost and forgotten. So we're going to now go into a handheld labyrinth walk. I want to just invite you before we do this to, um, and I think we're going to have a slide for those of you who don't have a handheld labyrinth. But for those of, of you who are curious, if you don't know what they are, you can get these online. And you'll see here, um, there's so many ways that you can use this. I'm trying to tilt this so that it's straight. It's hard to remember how to do this the opposite way. There we go. Um, what you'll see in the center is a, a six-petaled flower. And that six-petaled flower, by the way, the six-petaled rose, has been a symbol of Mary Magdalene from the earliest days of Christianity. We've even found archaeologically that it was carved on the oldest synagogue in the world in Magdala, which I think is fantastic. But throughout um, particularly France, but I've also seen them in Italy and England, the places that were associated as monasteries, as pilgrim places with Mary Magdalene are marked with a six petaled flower. Um, and so here with this labyrinth, there is only one path and the same thing will be true with the um, the image that um, Patricia is going to show for us. And for those of you who have a handheld labyrinth, you'll just Follow this path with your finger in the grooves. You could even do it with your eyes closed. That's a really interesting experience. And for those of you who will see an image on your screen, you'll just follow the image with your finger. Um, and we're going to have music again playing. This particular song that you're going to hear is once again, Catherine Breslovsky. Um, and she's singing a, an ancient song in Aramaic, uh, the language of Jesus that's called Ilono, um, which is the tree of life. So it, it's typical, um, you know, there's so many different ways that you can use this, but I'm going to invite you this time as you follow the pathway to just let your mind um, see what images arise. One of the things about um, working in the Magdalene path is um, the Gospel of Mary and the Gospel of Thomas both put an emphasis on cultivating images. And this is linked in the Eastern Orthodox tradition um, with icons and with a practice called Visio Divina that I introduce in my 22 day series. Um, but just notice, are there any images that are coming to your mind? Are there any words that bubble to the surface? And you can just repeat those words, you know, beloved, 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 like a little mantra. And then when you get to the center, I invite you to explore each of these petals with your fingers, just to feel here, um, each of the petals in the center and feel your connection um, with Mary Magdalene tonight. Um, and just notice you might even, you might come with a question of tell me who you are or what do you want me to know? Or what is your message for me? And, um, and then you can follow the same pathway out here. So um, we'll follow that pathway and then noticing the images and the words that arise when we're done 
on with this. Um, we'll have in the chat box then um, any questions that have been logged and we'll have an opportunity to share that. Um, but I would be very interested if you want to share um, what images and words came for you. So Patricia, I'm going to pass, pass the labyrinth to you now. Oh, may I say one more thing about, about Catherine? Because um, this is one of those extraordinary things. Catherine, whose voice you're going to hear, um, was an atheist scientist when Mary Magdalene came into her life. She had no, she grew up in, in a communist family that had fled from Russia and had absolutely no interest in religion. And she went to the cave of La saint Bon. And while she was sitting in that cave, what Mary Magdalene whispered to her was actually shouted, sing, sing. And she said, what? Because she had, she says she, her voice, she says, was like, she had no voice at all for years and years and years. But she somehow knew that this is what she was called to, this imperative to learn, to claim her voice. So there's an added layer there as you hear this incredible hypnotic voice, that this was the voice that is the flowering of listening to what that still small voice whispered to her in the cave of Mary Magdalene.
So noticing, is there a word? Is there an image that's echoing inside your heart? And if so, I invite you to put that in the chat box. Is there a message that you received? I kept hearing the word trust, trust, trust. Persevere, Sandra says compassion. Uh, the invitation to do ceremonial fire for a friend who had just passed. Follow your golden thread. Oh, another person had trust as well. Surrender. Witness. Listen. Beautiful. So you see what a simple practice. This was only four minutes and 30 seconds. But, but if you're new to this, just notice, you know, was there anything that you felt about returning to your own heart, returning to balance, to returning to the good, the true and the beautiful. It's a wonderful, wonderful and simple tool that we can have. So easy to be done in any situation. If we're feeling flustered by work, if we have a difficult conversation, to just enter into that practice for just five minutes and see what greets us. So I think we're at the point now that I would love to entertain your questions um, to hear what might be stirring inside of you. So if you would um, put those questions in the chat box and we'll begin to address those. Don't be shy. Um, it's one of my favorite parts about doing talks like this. I love the questions that come, especially if they're ones that surprise me. So I'd love to hear what might be stirring inside of you, um, what you maybe feel called to, or something that you'd like to know more about. This was kind of a quick survey of many things. Um, Kayleen? Um, this is Patricia. yes, and there were a couple of questions in the chat during the conversation. One Great. was when you showed those beautiful icons um, of um, Mary on one side and Jesus on the other side. Yes. There was a question about um, there was a question about what cathedral that was. Where, where <laughs> so are those? It's called San Michel du Var. Um, and I'll put that, that name again in the chat box as well. It's in um, the town of Flayosque, which is in Southern France, um, small, tiny, tiny village. Um, sorry, that should say D-U-V-A-R um, in Flayosque. And it's a monastery that was made um, just in the past 30 years, actually, but it uses the blueprint of Torinay Abbey, which had been um, created by Bernard of Clairvaux in the 12th century. And um, those frescoes are extraordinary. Vadim Garin is the iconographer. And I'll just briefly say, because it's just such a magical story, you know, how how Mary Magdalene really works with people. Um, Jean-Yves Leloup was a Dominican priest at the cave of Mary Magdalene when he heard the still small voice whispering inside of him to explore um, the non-canonical texts. And so he began to study the gospel of Mary, the gospel of Thomas. And eventually he was drawn to leave um, the Dominican order. And he was told to follow this path um, to find a French Orthodox order. And meanwhile, a Russian monk was told that he needed to go to France and to revive the French Orthodox tradition following in Mary Magdalene's footsteps. So the two of them met together. And then um, there was another man who was a veterinarian school at UC Davis. And um, he was on a Buddhist vision quest when he heard this voice telling him to go and find this French Orthodox church. And now he's the bishop. So all three of them came together with Vadim, who is from Uzbekistan, and they would pray the scriptures and they would see what images arise. And then they would 
together discuss the image that had arisen in their community of prayer. And then Vadim spent 13 years painting those frescoes. And you can go online um, and I will put his name. If you put this um, in, um, his name, and there's a videotape on YouTube called Icon. Um, and it is a five minute video of a drone footage of going into this monastery, which is just staggeringly gorgeous. And again, San Michel Duvar. And it's Catherine's voice singing again on that videotape because she is now the musical director and composer for that monastery during their festival of Mary Magdalene in the summer. Wonderful, thank you. There was another question um, um, where somebody wanted you to explain a little bit again about when Jesus was descending to heal the ancestors and Mary Magdalene was ascending. Yeah. What was she doing? What, why was, what, was, what was her part? Yeah, so in the Gospel of Mary, when she discusses in the, in the last part of that, this vision that she has, she is having to confront, I mean, you could call them gatekeepers if you want, but there are these forces within that are oppressing her. And she enters into this place where it's called the climates of darkness. And there's different, different authors translate each of those seven climates differently, but wrath is pretty universal. Um, pride is one way that you could describe it. Things that eventually probably turned into the seven deadly sins. And um, we know from uh, the Gospel of Luke that there is a reference um, in there. It says that Mary Magdalene, that Jesus was accompanied by Mary Magdalene and other women um, who helped minister to them out of his needs and provide for him. And it, when it mentions Mary Magdalene, it has a parenthesis that says, from whom seven demons were cast. And many scholars now looking at that feel like this is a reference to that, that what she is cast, what Jesus helps her cast out are the things that we might later think of as the seven deadly sins, which of course all of us have, right? You know, is there anybody on this call who is not subjected to anger or sloth or envy or any of those things? Um, they've had different names across the time. So Mary Magdalene is on her own personal journey of healing during that time. Well, Jesus is tending to the ancestral wounds. And I think both are important and could have a valuable place in Holy Saturday liturgies. What do we need to confront and clear and cleanse and heal within ourselves? What are the ways that we go astray? You know, the word sin originally was an archery term and it meant to miss the mark. So what are ways that we miss the mark from being our best selves and how can we confront those? So Mary's gospel speaks to that personal journey while Jesus's journey on Holy Saturday is really about going back to the ancestral wounding. And I think they're both essential, both essential. There was one question about um, the St. Matthew's passion. It was yeah. a, the film. Yeah. Uh, was it who was it done by? And then somebody... Simon Rattle and the Berlin Philharmonic. Okay, Simon Rattle. And it's Berlin incredible. Film. Simon Matt Rattle and the Berlin Philharmonic. There's um, fully staged versions. There's two versions now because he's done it with different casts of St. Matthew's Passion and St. John's Passion. And usually during Holy Week, they let you have a seven day trial free with the Berlin Philharmonic. Otherwise, you can buy a month pass for some ridiculously low rate, like, you know, eleven ninety nine or something, and have access to seeing it for an entire month, as well as all of the library of Berlin Philharmonic. I see that there was one question about what are the other gospels like Thomas and Mary called? Sometimes they've been called Gnostic, G-N-O-S-T-I-C. And that word comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means an inner knowledge. It's like it's access not to facts, but to inner wisdom. And um, this is a much longer conversation because um, you'll find people arguing about whether that's really an, um, an appropriate word um, to use anymore, because it kind of gives this idea that there were Orthodox Christians, and then there were the Gnostic Christians, and that they're in opposing camps. 
But in truth, as Elaine Pagel says in, in her wonderful book that is called The Gnostic Gospels, um, the, um, the first few centuries of Christianity, I love this phrase, were a riot of pluralism. There were hundreds of stories, hundreds of stories about Jesus. And there were so many different views. It's just mind boggling. Like one of the views that just blew me away was discovering there was a community in Alexandria that traced their roots back to the disciple Salome. And they had an altar for Pythagoras, Plato, Aristotle and Jesus, and they kept persisting in the Eleusinian mysteries and they believed in reincarnation. So that was a radically different kind of Christianity than we think of, but it coexisted along with the development and preceded the thinking of, of, of people like St. Augustine, you know, that that was another kind of Christianity. Um, and that it wasn't actually until the fourth century when Emperor Constantine converted and became Christian, that it was decided, it began to be decided, here's what you need to believe if you're a Christian, and here are the books you should read if you're, if you're a Christian, and you shouldn't read these other books that other people say. But before then, there were literally hundreds. And so the Gospel of Mary um, um, is one text. There's actually been three copies that have been found in, um, and they've been in the Coptic language and the Greek language. And they were, were copies of the same text from 200 years apart, which is kind of amazing that they survived these papyrus pieces. Um, and so that exists by itself. But in 1945, um, in the caves of Nag Hammadi, and I'll write that in the chat box so that you can look this up. Um, the Nag Hammadi um, library was recovered and found again in 1945. And there are 52 books that are here. And in this collection are several texts that highlight the importance of Mary Magdalene in the Jesus community as a disciple who had special knowledge and special teaching and who Jesus um, trusted perhaps more than any of the other disciples. Um, right in Portland, there's something called the Salome Institute of Depth Psychology. I'm writing this down in the chat box. Um, and if you're interested in this, if this is one of those things that makes your spine tingle, um, there's a whole six part series I, I filmed with them last year called Jung and the Gnostic Gospels. And you can, um, you can look that up and listen to, um, you know, how many hours is that? Nine hours of recorded lecture about that. Um, I'm seeing a, a question that says, is the beloved companion a complete version of Mary Magdalene's gospel? Okay, so this is another text that has been brought to light and translated in our own times. Um, and um, I will put this as well in the text. It's called the gospel of the beloved companion. And um, the the translator of that is uh, a woman named Jean de Quillon. So that's now there. And this is a book that was published, I, I want to say 12 years ago now. I, I, I may be off a few years. And um, what it claims to be is it claims to be um, a text written by Mary Magdalene and that it is the, it, the original text, if you will, of the Gospel of John. Um, that also includes the Gospel of Mary with the missing pages. Now, um, this is very controversial because the, um, the publisher of this says that they have this ancient document, but they're not allowing anybody to see it. So it's not possible to historically verify this through any kind of carbon dating. Um, Jean also claims that this is the text that the Cathars used in the 13th century. Um, for those of you who might not know that, they were a group of people who were followers of Jesus and that flourished in southern France um, and followers of Mary Magdalene. Um, and they were the reason that the Albigensian Crusade was launched and the medieval Inquisition. And as they were being burned and as they were being tortured before being burned for heretics, um, the things that they quoted as their scripture um, were written down by inquisitors that they were quoting the Gospel of John, but they made reference that there were some differences there. Um, it was actually a capital crime for hundreds of years 
to own a Bible in the vernacular language. This is the root, of course, of the Protestant Reformation, but several centuries before that, this was the crisis um, in, the, in, um, in the 12th and 13th century in Southern France. And you could indeed be burned alive for owning a copy of the gospel in the vernacular language. Um, so this text of the gospel of the beloved companion claims that this was the text that the Cathars used and that they had inherited and passed it down from Mary Magdalene's teaching. And then in the 12th and 13th centuries, it was translated from Greek into Occitan, which is the Provencal dialect, the, the, the language of Southern France. Um, this much I can tell you. Um, you will need to decide in your own heart, as, as the author says in the preface, you need to look in your own heart if this is true or not. She, is, she and the community that it's associated with are completely unwilling to release this for scholarly scrutiny. So I can't speak with absolute assurance one way or the other on its historical veracity. I can say it is definitely worth your time to read and to contemplate. And that those so-called missing pages, which are, occur in chapter 42, um, are some of the most beautiful spiritual teaching I've ever encountered. It's just really extraordinary. And it's about the ascent of the soul um, on the tree of life and how, you know, that for each level that Mary confronts of darkness and wrath, there is the fruit that she must eat of virtue. And it's, it's fascinating. But again, um, you'll need to come to your own decisions about that. But I do encourage people to read it um, and to explore that in greater depth. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, Connie's going to ask questions now. Mm -hmm. OK. OK. So there is a mention here. Uh, where can we learn more about the esoteric teachings around the Black Madonnas? And, we had one lady um, say that we could go to Matthew Fox and the Black Madonna. I was wondering if you had any other thing to suggest. Yeah, certainly Matthew Fox has has a deep devotion to this. Um, one of the first books that I read years and years and years ago was uh, China Gallon's Longing for Darkness. You might find something there. Um, I'll put the names of two of the authors that have written about the connection um, between possibly Mary Magdalene um, and the Black Madonna um, and in the chat box. These are, are um, authors that you can find books about their writings on the Black Madonna. Um, and I will be spending one um, one day's post in the coming 22 days that the series that just, just started today and enrollment is open for two more days. I do have one post that's about that connection. Um, and you can also look at the works of Anne Baring. Um, um, she may have some things online um, or in her books. Um, on the, the sacred feminine. Um, she's another um, author worth paying attention to in England. We differ about some things, but I, um, I, I respect her greatly. So those are our directions that you can go. If you're interested in general about Black Madonnas, if you're curious what they look like and where they are in the world, there is a fabulous website called Interfaith Marian Pilgrimages that is um, by my friend Ella Rosette who has made it her life's work um, to, um, to explore the stories of this um, throughout. Um, I'm seeing an, a question, how can you get to the, um, my web, uh, if you go to my website, which I'm putting in the chat box right here, uh, sorry, www, Kaylee Nasbo, it should say, um, there is a link that will take you to the um, the 22 days course. But if Denny or somebody else could pull up the direct link, that would be fabulous. Um, and there's a couple of, of um, online Zoom sessions as part of that. And then every day that there's not a Zoom session, there is a post with stories of Mary Magdalene and her companions and connections between them. And I'll go into detail about one particular Black Madonna that's in Marseille that um, has deep, deep, deep connection um, with Mary Magdalene and is really profound. It's amazing. I was there for the first time just a few weeks ago and it blew me away. Well, that's great. There's a question, is your dissertation available to be read or published somewhere? Um, so it is available to be read on ProQuest. I have to say that so many things have changed. I wish I could 
kind of go, I, I am going back this year and I'm revising it and contemplating which publisher I should use because I want to make it more user friendly. Um, the material that I ended up putting in the 40 days of Mary Magdalene is, is the juiciest bits of that that I think is really useful. So much of the work that I do, a lot of it has been like left brain scholarship with text, but so much of it has been art and music and um, that other side of the brain um, that it's very hard to put it in just a book format. So I need to find the right publisher who could publish a gorgeous, like a coffee table book with all of the images because so much of the meaning of what I found, you know, it, it's true that a picture is worth a thousand words. And in this case, I would need a zillion words to com to communicate what I found with the music and the art and the contemplative practices that I learned as well. Okay, uh, thank you. Were Jesus and Mary Magdalene trained in mystery school? Well, that's an interesting question, isn't it? So you'll have many different versions of this story too. I mean, one of the, one of the things I love when I'm, I have different hats, you know, I have my hat that I wear that is a contemplative practitioner that I have certain practices that I love. And then I have the, um, the cultural historian and the mythologist. I love all the material that I gather. Um, and there are so many things that we can't know for sure. I'll say that because, you know, even when we have, even with the Bible, you know, the gospel of Mark is the earliest record that we have, and it's from seven or probably around 70 AD. So you think about that gap of time and all the stories that we don't know for sure. There have been many people who have um, said that they've had visions or dreamt about certain things. You'll have people who say that they channeled information and you'll have a lot of writers who've written books that imagine these sorts of things. So as an example of this, here, here's one, uh, one story um, that might interest some of you here. You know, England has its own Magdalene tradition and Jesus tradition. And one of the things that they say is that in Glastonbury, Joseph of Arimathea was Jesus's brother, uh, uncle, and he took Jesus with him on his tin trading missions to Cornwall and they went to Glastonbury. So England will often proudly proclaim that they had the very first church because they had a church before Jesus even died. They had a, a church there. Um, and from that seed of the British legends, there have been several authors who've imagined the one that comes to mind first and foremost is Elizabeth Cunningham, who's written a series of novels called the, I think it's called the Magdalene Chronicles, but I think there's four of them. And she imagines that Jesus and Mary Magdalene are both at Druid mystery schools in Glastonbury, and they meet each other there for the first time. So there's all kinds of, of stories about that. There are things that may be a little bit more historical about perhaps were they part of an Essene community, um, that that might have been a possibility. Um, there are other people who claim that they absolutely feel convinced that Jesus went to India and studied there, that those lost years of Jesus and his youth, some of those were spent in India. You have other people who are convinced that um, that they were both initiated into mysteries in Egypt. You know, we know that um, from from the Bible itself, that the Holy Family fled to Egypt for several years and only returned later. And so there's a great question mark around that. Um, many people feel convinced that Mary Magdalene um, became a priestess of Isis and that that's how she had access to such a rich trove of spikenard and myrrh, all of those oils, which cost so much, you know, in the, um, in the biblical stories, it says, um, that Judas protests that that it was worth a year's wages. Well, how did she get a hold of that? Some people say it's because that she had an apothecary and that she was trained in the healing arts and the use of essential oils in the lineage of Isis and Egypt. So there's all these different versions. And I always encourage people to explore what, you know, there's this great phrase, um, in the medieval Christian mystic tradition, um, I think Mechtilde Magdeburg is the first person I know who said this about what plucks the strings of your heart. What plucks the strings of your heart? 
And I imagine if we went through um, the audience on this call and I were to ask you, each one of you would have a different string that was resonating. And I would just encourage you to follow that and see where it leads you. Um, I would also like to say that part of my approach to this I'm very interested historically. Like I do like to know, I can say this with certainty that this historically happened, but that's a lot less of material than I'd like to talk about. So for the rest of it, I like to invoke Joseph Campbell. And Joseph Campbell was asked once, he was said, you know, Professor Campbell, Professor Campbell, is it true? Is it true? And he said, of course it's true. And some of it might've happened. And I think that we, we need to know the difference of what we can say historically as facts that occurred and what we can say is a myth with meaning, because there are many things. I'll give you one example that most of us in scholarship, almost everybody that I know, uh, actually everybody I know who is a scholar says that the story that Mary Magdalene was an adulterous sinner and a penitent prostitute has been thoroughly discredited and disproven. And yet it's a story that we all grew up with. And when I was first doing my work, I was, I was amazed that one workshop I gave, a woman came up afterwards with tears in, my, in her eyes and said, please don't take that story away from me. And she she told me this absolutely harrowing story about how she had got undergone so much trauma and sexual abuse and that she had become a sex worker herself. And that part of her own healing journey was to feel that Mary Magdalene was still beloved and chosen as the first witness, even though she had been a prostitute. And that was a great example and a very humbling experience for me to realize that that these stories speak to us at the nexus point of where our deepest need might be. And so even if I could historically discredit some things, if there is a version of the story that resonates in your own heart, that you feel like, ah, oh, in my bones, I feel like this is true. It's probably because there's some profoundly healing energy to that that has meaning for you. And, and as an example of that, you know, it could well be that Mary Magdalene did not go to France. Other people say she went to Ephesus. Other people said she died in Jerusalem. For me, the truth is that she was there because when I go there, I feel something profound. But that doesn't mean everybody feels something profound. So I just want to encourage you, you know, I love to have the double lens. Yes, know the history. Yes, also know the myth and pay attention to what is awakening inside of you. Because sometimes there are stories that that have a kernel of depth and meaning in them that we need. And I'm in, I'm curious about that too. I'm I'm curious about all of those. I well, thank you so to... much for the wonderful wonderful presentation you're going to take over patricia yeah thank you connie so thank you so much Kay, um kayleen that was a wonderful presentation um i i, I um i'm so touched by it oh, thank so you touched, so touched by it um i've put in the chat here um some of the stuff that we do uh, some of the works that we do at trinity cathedral that I'm going to get people on our mailing list so that you can know about our virtual walks and um, our upcoming walks and I put on our website um, so that people can know. And we've also, Denny, put in um, the information about your website and the information about your trip to um, Scotland coming up and, and um, the um, information about um, Mary Magdalene in Provence. Great. So Thank everything you. is there. And I think it's just about time to end. Unfortunately, I could listen to you all night. <laughs> and you were so, already with me for 90 minutes this morning. <laughs> 90 minutes this morning. So I, I could listen all night, but I think it's probably time to stop. And I think that you um, are going to finish with a prayer. Yes. Yes. Thank you. So for those of you who lit candles before. I invite you to hold those in your hands right now and to gaze at them, at the light, at the flame. 
a light behind all lights and sun behind all suns. O song that echoes throughout the centuries, through time and space. <coughs> we thank you for gathering us together tonight to remember the goodness, truth, and beauty that lies at the heart of Magdalene, but also is a seed of possibility inside each and every one of us. In the days and months and years that are left to us, may we have courage to take this journey to, to awaken our deepest truth, our deepest knowing, to follow our tears, our longings, and the stirrings of our hearts to say yes, to say yes to you, to become part of the healing of the world, part of the song of celebration that sings throughout the ages, a song of unity, love, and peace. As we blow our candles out, then I like to say that I'm not extinguishing it, rather I'm blowing it out to you. And may you feel that surround you in the hours, the days to come. I hope we meet again. Good night, friends. <laughs>